You're listening to pros and pros. <laughs> okay, I need to get out of my head. Nip and nip and a fast in the colors of Kia Civil of Sisi who find your bande here the tracks. Hot pictures in the cars is he potes a wakati to make unja mashati. You're listening to Pros and Possibilities, a collection of candid conversations with the dreamers and doers of our time and from different walks of life. These are the people who are shaping society and culture from wherever they are. We dive deep into their motivation, inspiration, creative process, and most importantly, what they envision for the future of society. I'm your host, Melissa Mbugwa. Yeah. I'd like to acknowledge Baraza Media Lab, whose support made this podcast possible. Baraza Media Lab is a community that supports independent media in Kenya. Find out more about them from the link in the episode description. Hello, hello. Welcome to episode four of Pros and Possibilities. I'm really excited with each passing episode. I get more and more excited to be able to tell these stories and to share this journey with you. So excitement. If you would like to connect more, follow us on the socials. Let's connect there and on email as well. You can find the details in the episode notes. This episode, I get to speak to an old friend of mine, Bifi Masia, who's also the maker of one of my favorite films ever called Kati Kati, which is one of those mind bending films that's also a redefiner of what African film can be. So I'm really excited to be able to speak to him and share, and share the conversation with you. He is also the man responsible for introducing me to Just a Band back in the day. And I love Just a Band so much since day one. And the theme music in this podcast is by Just a Band. And you can check out a link in the episode notes as well. So on, on the day when this interview was recorded, Biffy had the sniffles. And I'd just like to share with you in advance that it was not COVID-19 and he's in good health. It was it was simply a case of the passing sniffles <laughs> and he's in good health. Um, so I will read you his bio and then we can get right into it. Bithi is a filmmaker, writer and artist who has won recognition and several international prizes with his film Kati Kati. He's a founding member of the acclaimed experimental art collective Just a Band, whose collaborations include musicians like Childish Gambino, Owor Arunga and many others. His direction of music videos has earned him recognition from local and international press such as the New York Times, Fader, Huffington Post, and OK Africa. He's also a co-founder of NBO Film Festival. Hi, I'm Bifi, and welcome to Pros and Possibilities. I'm really excited to have you on as my guest because I've known you for so long, and I also stan you and your work. So this is an amazing chance for me to ask you questions about your work. All right. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> well, no pressure, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. Awesome. So, of course, well, I would have asked you this anyway, but I feel it's even more important now in 2020 to ask you how you're holding up and where you're finding peace and sanity from these days. Yo, uh, I don't know, man. Um, I guess holding up, doing well. Kenya, Kenya, I think, is a great training ground for adversity. Uh, <laughs> you know, like I was even talking with some friends earlier about how, you know, when the the lockdown first started, or rather when the first case was reported, you know, like we did have panic buyers, but we weren't like Americans who just bought toilet paper for no reason. <laughs> yeah, like you know, post election violence taught us what is necessary for our homes. So guys were like shopping essentials to be able to survive in the house for like two, three weeks and stuff like that. Anyway, point is uh, economic adversity and all these other things that are not new to most Kenyans uh, leave us not at the, in a good place, but it's not unfamiliar in these feelings. Mm. So, yeah, so it's fine. Uh, so, yeah, I'm dealing with it okay, I guess, and just waiting, weathering the storm. Yeah, and how are you, how are you finding your sense of, peace and sanity because there's been so much going on just every day around us yo uh my house like my, my family is uh maybe my wife like is 
most central to that sanity. And then mm. I just lose myself in a lot of music, video games, and books. Now you've asked, now we're going to enter this rabbit hole of what are you playing? <laughs> Which video game are you playing? <laughs> Uh, right now, I've been just obsessively playing Fortnite because it's low. It's a low ask game. Like I can tune out my brain while playing it, and it's free. And then, uh, musically, this week really been going through Florence and the Machine phase, and just being in my feelings thanks to Florence. So awesome! Are you are you getting um space? Because, well, you're an artist, so your work is really about expressing yourself and need to be present. So I'm wondering, being an artist, how the drama of this year has influenced the way you're looking at your work? Are you even able to work? Yeah, it took a while. Uh, the, the feelings were strange when all of this started. But then got back to work like normally. And what would I say? Like, I don't think it's affecting my work in any way, like directly, thematically or anything. For now, I've just been developing my own personal projects. Obviously, the commercial world, which is how I usually pay my bills, is dead. So I've had to like find alternative means to support myself. So it's uh, I, I don't know if I'd say it's directly affecting my work. It's, it's giving me time, though, to think about my work and stuff I was developing and just put my brain into that. So that's cool, I guess. How, how are you looking at your personal projects now, considering how much change is happening? How is that shaping the way you're looking at your work? It's not, it's not really, because uh, intuitively, my projects were never about the present. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my personal projects have a lot to do with my past and things that I've gone through in my life and my friends have gone through. So it's, they're more the thematically, I think, stuff that still goes on even in today's life, in today's world. So I, it's not directly affecting me. I'm not a... I guess personally as a creator, as a filmmaker and all, I'm not a man of the moment kind of guy. Yeah. Like I don't like addressing things as they're happening, especially in today's world where everything moves fast. So I feel like if you're not 100% in something, you're just wasting your time. And the thing I can get 100% into is my own life story and such things. Hmm. Okay, podcast over. <laughs> uh, bomb dropped gems ah, people can take away already <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying like that's very interesting and so because you mentioned you're not a man of the moment I have something from the not so distant past that you had shared in 2019 mm -hmm. you had shared in November I think towards the end pictures of Turkana yeah really really amazing beautiful um shots yeah that were just breathtaking wow. and for a lot of people me included i was so surprised to see this part of kenya that in a completely 100 percent 180 different way than how i'd been seeing it all my life so the question is how has that experience struck you yeah. how did it strike you then actually um is part one of the question and then part two of the question is, did that experience influence the way you think about how much more we have to discover about ourselves, about Kenya, about just life? Yeah. Uh, so uh, that travel to Turkana uh, was part of travel I did towards the end of last year to like six different East African countries, Kenya included. Uh, it's for a corporate project that I can't talk about yet, explicitly about what it's about. But I think the greatest thing that affected me on that trip was perspective in that. Even as travelers, as adventurers, as Africans ex experiencing the rest of Africa, the perspective you go to a place with really affects mm -hmm. how you take it in. You know, So like, for example, this corporate film I was making, mm -hmm. the whole point was... To see Africa as noble, no matter the, the nature and origin of what you're looking at. So from the dust all the way to the skyscraper, my responsibility was to make all of this noble and majestic. So mm -hmm. that no matter what, there's no, even poverty is not what you think it is, basically, so to speak. And, cause, and then, you know, I've also done other projects like for non-profits where the perspective is the opposite. It's like you need to go make a pity film. And that affects how you experience certain things mm -hmm. and places. You know, so like the fact that this one, I was on my see the best in everything uh, energy. Uh, it really changed how I viewed not just Kenya, but a huge chunk of Africa because I, was, I also went to Congo, DRC. I was in South Sudan and South Sudan, like not Juba, like we went in the inland where there are no roads. You're just driving through trees. 
and to find a certain village where yeah. these guys sleep outside. They don't even they, they don't sleep in tents. They sleep outside. That was one of the most majestic things and best experiences we had as a crew was chilling with these guys who for all intents and purposes like they're still in the colonial lifestyle and you know so with specific regards to Turkana and stuff it was was my first time there and it, it was this was I went out I was on the east side so usually the pictures you see are from the west side uh, mm. the west side is also where most of the bigger towns are like the east side only has like one big town which is like Galani which is where we were and it's it's, it's, it's interesting it's a very rocky landscape but it's, it's like the desert meets uh, some weird forest very soon so it's like it's not completely out there on its own it's yeah. It's quite an experience, you know, seeing seeing these alien landscapes that feel like Iceland meets, you know, it, it, it was it was interesting that this stuff is in our backyard, you know, stuff that films push and you're like, I have to go to Iceland for this. And it's like, oh yeah, you go up and do. And then like to kind of itself being gigantic. Mm-hmm. It's literally a sea. It felt like a sea. Yeah. You know, where you can't see the other the other side. So for me, the whole trip was was really something special. But I guess the whole point to, the, to answer your question was, I think it was just the perspective that we went out there with, which was just to, to see the best in everything we were filming, was I think the best takeout I, I got from it. And it's really affected my perspective on how I experience things even today. Interesting. And what else? Because you've mentioned Congo and Sa- South Sudan, I think. Yeah. And the other places you went, what were those places like? No, yeah, like, uh, you know, every African place has its own flavor, its own unique attitude, you know. Uh, so, like, South Sudan is interesting in that it's very wild westish, still a bit on edge because the war was not too long ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the people are very, very chill. I think chill is the phrase I'd use. And then also, like, it's just hot, man. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. ridiculous. Like, uh, it's Aircon City, you know. Um, so that's like Juba. And then driving out there. When people accept you, they they open up to you. But then they're also very uh, garnish because of the war, you know. Yeah. So it's like still very standoffish. But then if they are open to you, it's very nice. Uh, and then DRC. DRC is like wild because we went to two different cities. We are in Kinshasa and Lubumbashi. Lubumbashi is like the mining city. And that's where we went first. And I was surprised because it's like a beautiful, clean city. You know, like obviously the jobs are African jobs are African jobs. <laughs> uh, but like Lubumbashi was like, I was like, this day I feel like the DRC I hear about. Until we went to Kinshasa. Hey, Kinshasa was now like, oh, okay. This is, you know, you know, like we were yeah. talking about how Kenya feels like Africa light. Like there, that was the Guinness of Africa. You know, like that. Kenya is a blonde beer, just light yeah. and just bubbly. And Kinshasa is like Guinness. Uh, <laughs> Stout. So, yay. Hey, the, thick, the thickness. Yeah, uh, it's intense. So is that um, in the sense of, well, you know, that buzz, there's the buzz and chaos sense I get of it and dust. But do you also mean in terms of the energy of the people? Yeah, yeah. No, even in the energy. Like, Kishas is just like, everyone is just on 100. Uh, energy is high. The city is chaotic. But this is not a bad thing. As I said, like, I think if I'd gone there with a different attitude, I would have said it's a bad thing. But it's just like, you love to embrace it. Like, people say something will happen at a certain time. It happens three hours later. It's just how it is. You know, <laughs> uh, so and then you know we also went to Rwanda, which was interesting and sterile. And been to Rwanda a few times, so it was a new to me. But yeah, you know, Rwanda is Rwanda. You've been, you said you've been to Rwanda a few times before that. Did, was there any difference in how you perceived it this time, given the nobility lens you had gone with? No, I think I've had now Rwanda in several trips with different perspectives. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, my wife is half Rwandese, so there's family there. So I think I've gone now four times, and each visit has been with a very different lens. Uh, but the last two were a bit the same. So the last two was this trip for this corporate film. But then the one before that, I was invited by the state for their 25th celebration since the end of the genocide, 25th anniversary. So I also had a nobility aspect there. Like, there, I was being treated very well. But, but then the, the trip before that was not. It was like staying in hostels and, you know, you start missing some of the conveniences. It didn't feel as easy to get around as here. And it's a bit confusing with all the hills and everything in Kigali. But all in all, like, I think uh, my Rwandi's experience has always been positive just because because the nature of my trips have been more family oriented before. The perspective you go in with then makes you experience something very differently. 
It really does. I think it really, really does affect how an inconvenience can be either part adventure or part, like, I hate Africa. I want to go home. It depends on how you're looking at the stuff, you know? Yeah. Now I'm wondering how how much accommodation, how much room should we give for that uh, shifting in lenses? And you know how in Kenya, for example, the past few years, we've seen just so much go, you know, the opposite direction of what we would hope. And yeah. so you end, what ends up happening is you end up adapting, adapting and being like, we'll make it work. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. But at what point do we then realize, ah, uh-uh, now we just need to also fight back? I, I honestly don't know because I'm also like, you know, struggling. I think I reached my end with Kenya, not because we're not capable of anything else, but because it's the powers that be, the system that controls everything is so bent and corrupted and everything. And the powerful people have their hooks in so many things. That it would take such a gargantuan effort to like right the ship that sometimes it, this is my personal feeling. I'm not telling people to feel bad, but it's my like for me, my personal feeling. Sometimes it's just easier to just ah, okay make the most of the horrible space because even you know, like I was an activist in my early years, at the early years, like I'm that old, but <laughs> you're older <laughs> in Twitter years. Yeah, so old, by the way. <laughs> the, you know, like, I, I did that stuff. I tried to change things. I tried to get involved. And then it says the more you do it, the more you realize how whack everything is and how corrupted everything is. And yeah. so I still try to support people as much as I can who are trying to change things, making a booty and all of that. But, eh. It's, it's tough. It's tough out here. Sorry, I have the sniffles just to let the podcast know. I hope it's not COVID, but it's just the sniffles. There's no other uh, symptoms attached. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope there will not be any other symptoms attached. Now, as an artist, how does this keep you? Where do you find that space then to imagine freely and boldly when your external environment is just not necessarily enhancing, doing its best to enhance your feeling of lightness? Yeah, I don't know. But it's also the thing that I guess leaves me questioning if my work will ever get finished, made. You know, as much as I'm developing work, it's like, will this ever see the light of day? Will anyone care? Will this actually have any effect? But, you know, like the decision I made personally was I decided to focus on the things that matter to me, which are, for example, for me, the human condition itself. So the world system is the world system. It's a man-made thing. The capitalism, all of that. I mean, like, I'll say it now, like I'm anti-capitalist, I'm police <laughs> abolitionist, uh, <laughs> and all of that. But I, in terms of figuring out how to do that, I still don't know. But the thing that I do, that fascinates me the most is human resilience and emotion. The fact that people still cry for justice after thousands of years of injustice. And so my work is, I'm trying to direct it in that direction. So that's why I'm saying it's also not about the present. I am trying to look at what things made me and the people I love the way they are, you know, um, Mm -hmm. what is it that keeps us still here? And for those who are not here, what is it that maybe led them away? Not led them, but you know, if, if that makes sense. Like, just what, what are these things that can contribute to the human condition? And I think that's where the most imagining the imagining will happen and in the near future, rather than externally in the bigger systems. It's like, you know, that's why, like, guys are shocked about how Generation Gen Z are so activist in a yeah. way that Gen X and Millennials were not. You know, like, Gen Z were are protesting every everything. You know, in SA, Gen Z are the guys who got statues taken down and fees must fall and all of that. In America, they were protesting gun violence in schools. While they're in school, we, we, we pro-rioted, but because of sports, you know, like... <laughs> like, <laughs> like, hey, Mazeoli Sker Jamu and Highway were fighting on, in Tao. It's like, why? Because a rugby game, someone said something, you know, like... <laughs> but... The, but I, I don't know about Kenyan Gen Zs, but I'm, I'm hoping Kenyan Gen Zs, although what I've seen, like, it's, it's sorry, small tangent. One small thing that I, yeah. could make, I guess the more I live in Kenya that I find very peculiar is we have an activism stage at the beginning of every decade. Uh-huh. So let me go back to the 80s. When was the coup? The coup was 82. Okay. Skip forward. When was Saba Saba? 91. 92, 91, 91, yeah, yeah, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90
it was like an activism of exactly. beliefs. Exactly. Twenty tens. Now this is also when I was in the activism stage because now we had also Chokatki Baki's danger tricks, and then Uhuru and Ruto, ICC people were being like these guys of being tried for crimes against humanity were being pushed as presidential candidates. So that's when I was also activism and uh, activisming. Yeah. And then 2012 the election happened, they win, and there's deflation of that activism. And then we skip to 2010s. What's happening now? Uh, not 2010s, you know, 2020s. And now you have like the protests that were happening for police brutality and all of that. And I'm just like, huh, now I'm waiting for 2030s to see if there's another. Like, it's like we, we shoot Fura at the beginning yeah. of a decade, and then there's like uh, something crushes us and deflates us back into operating. Compliance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Compliance. Is there. Interesting. That's really interesting. I never thought of that before. But huh, is this activism like over the decades? Is it even changing? I don't know if it is. Aside from Boni, even now Boni is just a veteran because those twenty tens I'm talking about, I was there with Boni. You know, yeah. Like, not at the wave. Like he, I was like behind him <laughs> in the protest. I was also um in the protest. I remember actually going to protests. Yeah, we used to. We did. (laughs) Yeah. And I even had uh, an organization I had started with some friends called Kuwait Serious, which was about civic activism. You know, like, we were doing shit. But then, anyway, my point, this was a side story. I don't know why. (laughs) It it came up because you talked about how you find, for you, you focus on the human condition. Yeah, I I think that's, I guess, where I settled because it's like, no matter what, how creative we got with educating, you know, civic education and all these other things. We even had a TV show like I worked uh, on a TV show Shahidi no what is it called uh, John Gil- with Wongozi you know yeah. where it is like a reality TV show like Apprentice but based on uh, leadership and proper leadership hey it's tanked like a dance you know and <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah. Okay, so you focus now on the more long term sort of in spite of context human condition yeah, because, you know, at the end of the day, we still have to be kind to each other. And I think, hopefully, if kindness wins, the systems can't exist with kindness. The systems exist with greed, in my point of view. And kindness and greed are not... There's no overlapping on that on that Venn diagram. Those are two different circles. They're like two tires, front tire and back tire of a car. Is, <laughs> so, so that's why, like, I just decided my focus is there. Whether the work will get made or not, it's faith I have. Uh, that's the only thing I can hold on to. And yeah, so we'll see. And your work really is, um, well, you know, I'm a huge fan of Kati Kati. I've watched it so many times. I don't know how many times. <laughs> I still watch it on Showmax every now and then. And you're so using Kati Kati as an example of your work, all your work, I think, or most of it, is very edgy and bold. It basically doesn't make apologies for being itself. It's whether or not the audience will fully be on board or fully understand what it was about. Your work is just there as it is, authentically. Yeah. Yeah, so is there an opinion or idea or just way of looking at things that, that almost everyone disagrees with you on that that you still fight for? You've not backed down. No, I think I think where I have been lucky is it, it might not my stuff might not be mainstream, mm-hmm. but it does connect with some people. And thank you very much for your kind words just now, you know, like and I think that's the thing where because even like we started like Katikati, that was such a big risk for me because I had not told a story on that scale in terms of like being a feature. Uh, I was not sure if the strangeness and the weirdness I was writing, it felt right in my gut, but I wasn't sure if it would feel right by anyone else. And to the point where even the producers, everyone didn't know until it came out how it would be received. Uh, and the fact that you connected with people, not just here, but elsewhere and you know, I had I'd go for festivals and Q and A's, and people are talking about not ever having connected with African characters in an African film. Where you know, like, because sadly, a lot of African film is watched out there uh, in a in an exotic way, in that it it's like a peephole into the the strangeness and peculiarities of Africa that they're peeping through a window and they see it, so they don't connect. They just watch. It's like an aquarium or a zoo. They watch the Africa and they go. So hearing people connect with a character, you know, like directly. So rather than talking about it as being great, this or that form wise, mm. people were talking more emotionally, which for me was the win. I, I know the form of Katikati is rough around the edges. It's, it was a lot of us learning what to do. So the fact that people looked past that and went to an emotional place 
for me is the win. And that kind of stuff is what I keep pushing for. And sadly, even though you've done it once, people always question it because it's such a gut-inspired thing and you can't share gut feelings. And, to, and then I've, sadly, a film, until it's done, even a script doesn't give you, even you can pick your favorite film and then go read the script. Mm-hmm. I, and then the only problem is you'll have the film in your head already. But I promise you that the script doesn't give you the same feelings as a film because film is a, it's a multidimensional uh, art form. You know, it's, it's sonic, it's visual, it's, yeah, you know, like mm. it's theater. There's, you know, like there's a lot in it. So sadly, sometimes even like a film, if you take out the music, can hit you different if you take out the score <laughs> or, mm. and all of that. So sometimes getting people to believe in your vision all the way to the end, that's the thing that I have to keep. It's not fighting other people, but reminding myself to believe my gut. Because even in doing other people's projects and stuff, every time I've caved to their requests and not followed my gut, I have realized I made a worse decision. It's not that the thing ended up worse, but it couldn't be better, you know, like... Right, yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't live up to your standard of your own work. Yeah, and 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 or it misses emotionally on a level where right? it becomes better form wise, but a little emotional thing uh, ends up disappearing. And so I, I think that's the for me that's the core thing that I fight for. So I, that's why also I was talking about I'm not philos like I'm not philosophical in talking about world systems and Afrofuturism and political political systems and all. I I'm just focused primarily on narrowing down that emotional nugget of a story because I think that's that's just where I am. Huh. And what do you hmm, I and I don't want to ask what's your process <laughs> because that's I just I mean kill um, chickens and, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, spray their blood all over the house. And, uh, <laughs> and then you do yeah and other uh, weird art artsy people <laughs> process um i mean for example um in this season staying grounded is such a, a big a big theme for example what have you learned or observed if there's anything new that you've observed about the human condition the past few months that's sat with you huh. i think i think okay i think this year has forced people to be a lot kinder to each other a lot gentler with each other. You know, like, it's the first time where, you know, these rise and grind people who are like, yo, you have, you and Bill Gates have the same 24 hours in a day. This is the year they have no place in life. Yes. And instead you have people checking in on each other. And, you know, it's it's not just are you okay financially, but are you okay? Like, and are you are you taking time for yourself? Are you resting? Are you panicked? Are you anxious? I've seen more people being asked that than I have before in my life, like completely, you know, mm. uh, through social media, through personal interactions, because everyone knows how crazy the situation is right now. We, yeah, but it's not like look, this is new to, in life, generally. Pressures have always been happening, you know. Uh, it might not be, this one says that it's being applied nationally. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, people have lost jobs before. People have had, you know, economic crises and all of that. Because, yeah, because this year the shakedown is, it's catching us in our family relationships, you know, like yep. our marriages, our jobs, it's everywhere. Yep. And, you know, like even parents nagging kids for when you get a job, they, it's like, shut up. <laughs> it's a different world. Like, they're not doing that, you know, because that's why I'm saying like that rise and grind thing is not there just because everyone knows shit is whack right now. And it's like, just, are you okay? Are you surviving? Are you keeping well? Cool. You start there. <laughs> so that kind of kindness and gentleness is, is something I guess I, I really like to see. You've dropped so many bombs, and I mean, <laughs> as, a, as in gems, um, <laughs> already so far. I have one final question, which you probably answered already in a different direction. What are you feeling hopeful for these days? You know, small things. Hopefully. For example, like I'm, yeah, like I'm just super hopeful. I've been getting really excited every time little things happen. So, like, I see one cup flower blooming. <laughs> you know, uh, the sun coming out. So I've even found myself really looking forward, I guess also because of the slower pace of life, really looking forward, for example, to my morning coffee every day. That literally keeps me excited and going. It might sound like, oh, it's sad. No, it's not It's not sad. I'm starting to notice little things and to feel hopeful about small wins as well as the big wins. So I'm just curious, like, you know, what comes up for you? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, uh, as I said, for me, the main thing I look for is this peace <laughs> to go up on my day and grounding in different ways. But I guess what, what I'm feeling hopeful about, 
I guess it is also like what I was just talking about in terms of this year, how it's forced everyone to be different. And you know, I you know how I, was, I, I know I said I'm about to oppose something I said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, perfect. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was talking about how like the world systems are so rigid and you know, like look sometimes impossible to change. But COVID has changed so much already, you know, like toxic work culture. I don't think we'll ever, not, obviously toxic work culture takes different forms. But I'm talking about like, you know, those things for bosses needing to see you in the office 12, 16 hours a day mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I don't think some of those things are coming back because people are proven they can work at home with flexible hours and all of that. And it would be very stupid for next year for a boss to go back to thinking, I need to see you in the office at 16 and you need to leave at eight it's very stupid to go back to that kind of thinking so it, i guess that kind of hopeful leaves me hopeful that some of the more pervasive like the more horrible practices and cultures might also start disappearing uh so i don't know which ones but hopefully we can keep that kind of trajectory of just writing you know and inside a few years ago i guess with like me twos and all of that you know just correcting years of injustice it's happening slowly but hey it's good Awesome. This has been so fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to spread the love and let's keep talking. Check out the episode notes to find our contact deets and more juice from this discussion. Thank you for listening. Ah, 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 ah.